Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, today. Now I'm going to, maybe I'll pass your, uh, and it's it's a great honor to uh, to be here today and, and uh, our 20,000 ophthalmologists in the U.S., and only one of them has been the president of the AAO and the ASCRS, and that's this man here, Steve Opsbaum. And Steve has been the driving force in bringing glaucoma to the ASCRS. He's the person who got the ball rolling for Glaucoma Day, and we would not be here today without his enthusiasm and support. He's been a personal inspiration to me, and, and I feel very privileged to have his support and his friendship. So thank you, Steve. And as uh, Tom said, my uh, two daughters, Annie and Veronica, are here today. And I wanted to say that I'll be talking about projects that I've worked on with my wife, Dr. Mary Lynch, who you now know very well. And uh, it's hard to say where my ideas stop and hers start. I'll be talking about innovation. We know glaucoma surgery is very difficult, so how do you know if you have the right stuff? And I have a two-question test uh, with the help of Jeff Foxworthy that, that uh, you can take to see if you might be a glaucoma surgeon. Surgery, and you say yes, you might be a glaucoma surgeon. You would rather keep a patient with a red eye on four drops just to avoid an operation, you might be a glaucoma surgeon. This may be funny, but I don't want glaucoma surgery to be a joke. I don't accept that glaucoma surgery is not compatible with good vision or that it should be a last resort. So we need innovation, and that's what I'll be talking about today. Photographs. No hats or gloves or masks. Everybody has a, a mustache and they're all wearing ties. I, I try to keep in mind that future surgeons will look at our surgery just as we look at this picture today. It's actually a very important picture because it's the first example of texting during the case. <laughs> I think she's on Twitter asking uh, what the surgeon should do next. I want to focus on glaucoma and go back to 1936 and this article uh, from Dr. Otto Barkan, one of the first great glaucoma innovators, showing that goniotomy was effective for adult open-angle glaucoma. And I want you to look at this picture and focus on three things. Hat, microscope. Let's fast forward almost 50 years to this picture, also of a goniotomy from the, uh, the Becker Schaefer glaucoma book. And a hat, much better. Proved. The operation is the same. The instruments also the same. What's going on? For the cap and the scope, innovation is a natural, unstoppable process. But for the surgery, we seem to be in a time warp. It's not just goniotomy. Dr. Bruce Shields is one of my personal heroes and knows everything about glaucoma. But in his book from 2005, trabeculectomy technique is described by a 25-year-old article. Maltino 3 came out, the advertising message was new, 30 years, and third generation. But if you look in the uh, 1977 one, if I can get the pointer, well, you can tell, and compare it to the 2007 model, they look almost the same for tube uh, shunts because the tube versus trab study strongly favors tubes as the better operation. So you would think it's a great time for tube shunt companies to focus on making the surgery better. But no company is actually doing this for improvement. The tube shunt operation has way too many steps. This is just the uh, highlights. And it's not that I'm too lazy or don't have the time. The flip side of too many steps is too many problems, and we're all too familiar with pictures like this. The question is why innovation in glaucoma surgery is so slow. And to answer this question, I'm going to be reviewing some general concepts of innovation, including minimalism and simplification, and also the adjacent possible. And then review three innovations that we've been involved in and, and apply these concepts. How did they develop, and why weren't they successful? 
unfortunately. Uh, and also look to the future and what can we do to promote innovation. Surgery is minimalism in action, smaller incisions, more efficient technology. Simplification is not always simple. The hat is clearly simpler, but the microscope is more complex. But the view is better, and that's going to make the surgery easier. And the same is true with small incision cataract surgery. It's simpler and more efficient, but it's made possible by a complex and expensive FACO machine. And we're going to see the same type of thing with femtosecond technology. Perhaps the best definition of simple is when the patient says, thanks, doctor, that was easy. You can find examples of all of these patterns in glaucoma innovation. But I want to focus on the adjacent possible because it's a great metaphor for the incremental steps in innovation. Stuart Kaufman to describe the zone of options that surrounds us. These are the choices that are possible right now. Each choice then determines the next options. Cooperation expands it, competition shrinks it. Describes it this way. Think of it as a house that magically expands with each door you open. You begin in a room with four doors, each leading to a new room that you haven't visited yet. These four rooms are the adjacent possible. But once you open one of those doors and stroll into that room, three new doors appear, each leading to a brand new room that you couldn't have reached from your original starting point. The possible is neutral. It's the border zone. So why do we pick one door over another? In surgery, minimalism drives the choices and take us all the way back to glaucoma surgery in the 1980s when we were just figuring out that failure was due to scarring of the bleb from conjunctival trauma. And at that time, we didn't have anti-metabolites. So the question occurred to me, why not operate from inside the eye and avoid the big incision? Wouldn't that improve success? And some of the early instruments had two cutters. One was a tree fine. This was very bad for cutting vitreous, but it was great for an internal sclerectomy. And this was the adjacent possible. The instrument was the door into the next room, driven by simplification. That led to the glaucoma mechanical tree fine, or trabecufine, which used vitrectomy technology to do glaucoma surgery from inside the eye. With one 19-gauge incision, we could do an iridectomy, sclerectomy, with no conjunctival incision. We've just done the iridectomy with the vitreous cutter, and now we're going to show that the infusion goes down both the center bore and also around the cutting uh, component, so it, it's out of two places, and, and you'll see the cutter go across the anterior chamber, we're going to engage the sclera just above the iris but below the cornea. We didn't have viscoelastic so there's infusion. So I, I'm pushing the instrument through the sclera and you'll see the uh, conjunctival balloon up as we, as we make it all the way through. And now the bleb is being created and we're going through and making sure the uh, little piece is completely uh, out of the hole. So, so that's it. That's, that's the whole glaucoma operation with no conjunctival incision. The problem was that we had, we had trouble with the hole. It was either too open and we got hypotony or it would close and fail. But we abandoned it before we had viscoelastics or mitomycin. Imposed by the adjacent possible. You can only go to the next room. You can't leapfrog rooms. If you do, you can be ahead of your time because you may need something else. Charlie Kelman did his first FACO in 1967, but it wasn't until many years later that it really became successful because he needed supporting inventions like foldable lenses and many other inventions in order to be fully successful. I didn't know it. Dr. Bob Rich was inventing the Rich Rivet, which is like the Express, but implanted from inside the eye to keep a scleral hole open. He even cited the trabecufine in his patent, but he never told me about it, so there was no chance to collaborate. 
Stephen Johnson deals with this in his book. He, he says that one person may have half of an idea, but he needs the person with the other half. So if we had worked together, we may have been successful. Acuity meter or PAM, because this is an example of where the two halves met, and, and I was actually there. John Minkowski was a resident with uh, me at Johns Hopkins, and Dave Guyton is, is on the right. He was a professor uh, and an optics expert with many patents, and we were all having lunch at the cafeteria, and John said, what if you could project a Snellen acuity chart directly onto the retina? Wouldn't that let you bypass the media opacities? And Dave said, yes, it would, and here's how you would do it. And that lunchtime conversation led to the PAM. Cafes, societies, meetings. Matt Ridley in the Wall Street Journal uh, wrote that humans succeeded because trade promoted exchange, not only of goods, but also ideas that the rate of progress depends on the rate at which ideas are having sex. And he's trying to sell newspapers, I'm trying to keep people awake for my, for my talk, but the point is reproduction creates new genetic combinations and exchange of ideas creates innovation. Ideas having sex, why can't glaucoma surgery get more dates? Maybe we need a better Facebook page enough exchange. There are, are relatively few glaucoma specialists and few organizations. In fact, only one national organization, the American Glaucoma Society, and surgery is, is a low priority. Surgeons should have a separate voice, and in 1992 we tried to start the Glaucoma Surgical Society. We had a very successful meeting on Kiowa Island that was devoted to surgery. Fifty glaucoma specialists attended. It was self-paid, there was no industry support because there was no industry. Um, and there were many now famous glaucoma specialists and that's only a partial list. This rain and lightning for three days. This is Rick Lewis looking for his golf ball. The real problem was the AGS. They were so opposed to us and, and really took it personally and were very threatened. And Mary and I were in a very junior position as, as faculty members, and we just didn't have the will to oppose the leadership, and we just gave up. And now, 19 years later, the AGS has 600 members, and it's still the only national organization, and we're still doing trabeculectomies. This is minimalism to the extreme. It's a device that creates a drainage pathway right through the cornea. A, a uh, prototype is in a rabbit eye. Tiva completely, make glaucoma a physics problem, not a biology problem. But it turned out we were just trading one set of problems for another. We couldn't find the right material, we couldn't get proper fixation, we had entered the adjacent impossible, and we were half an idea looking for the other half. Becton Dickinson was actually working on a similar concept based on a similar patent by Thad Wandell. But there were nearly identical patents within in two years, mine in 94 and Thad's in 96, and they're strikingly similar. It turns out the duplication is common, and when, when Mary and I have done something that's uh, somewhat new, we get letters, and, and people say, congratulations on your new thing. In fact, you may be interested to know that I actually thought of this many years before you and just did not develop it. And I have no doubt that this is true. These inventions are common. They're, they're everywhere in history. This is just a partial list. To continue with the adjacent possible room analogy, you're not the only one in the room. Mary and I started work on this in 1999. The goal was to restore normal outflow. It was the first device for trabecular bypass. It was, it was two tubes joined at one end. The concept was to put one leg down one side, one leg down the other side, and the joined end in the anterior chamber to bypass the meshwork. Reopening the existing outflow system, no hole, no bleb, no antimetabolite, no leaks and no hypotony. Fewer complications, less follow-up. The successful is circumferential flow. It shows a blue dye uh, passing into the canal and, and into the outflow system, and I've, I've stopped the movie to let uh, 
the narration catch up, but in a matter of seconds, it's completely around the eye, and the outflow system is is totally uh, full, and and blue dye is everywhere. And, and we thought this was how it, it worked in the human eye, and we're very optimistic that trabecular bypass would be very successful. It would enter the eye pass in the anterior chamber, go down the uh, tube, and then out the other end, and continue the bypass. After six years, we, we had no corneal problems. The uh, tube uh, being passed down one side and, and down the other side, and, and it was an operation that that um, that once the canal was found was was uh, very straightforward. Blood reflux would indicate that we were in the right place, and and uh, we're we're seeing blood reflux on the left hand side. We're passing the tube into the anterior chamber, and uh, and the blood in in the in, in the tube indicated. Uh, that we're in the right spot. And now watch the blood as it as it passes out of the tube and, and going back into the uh, outflow system. Breakthrough that we uh, we completed many studies and got into a, a, a phase three study, but it just wasn't lowering the pressure and we did not expect FDA approval, so the project was discontinued. It was approved in Europe, but it was never manufactured there. The pressure. The tube may not have been open, it may have been blocked by the meshwork. The flow, uh, as we know, is segmental, it's not circumferential, uh, and, and we needed more than one area of, of drainage. The lumen may have been too small, and the end may have been obstructed. The uh, photograph there is uh, fibrosis in a primate eye after the uh, tube had been implanted, so we had a evidence that fibrosis was occurring the fact that it didn't work out. It's impossible not to be optimistic about glaucoma surgery in the future because there are so many devices now being investigated. Is why now? The first reason is demographics. As the population ages, the number of cases is going way up. Furthermore, Zalatan and other prostaglandins are coming off patent, and that's going to take perhaps $500 million out of glaucoma therapy. Meanwhile, the, the, the glaucoma device market may be a billion dollars. So you're going to see ophthalmology companies starting to invest in surgery. And uh, Steve quoted me in one of his editorials as saying, glaucoma should be a surgical disease. I've been saying this for years, and it's not that I haven't been right. I just haven't been right yet. It's not that I think everybody needs a trabeculectomy, because as my technicians uh, would tell you, that would just uh, kill them and kill us. So we, we don't want everybody getting a trabeculectomy. But what I am saying is investment in glaucoma surgery is worth it, that it's a problem that, it can, that can be solved, and that a surgical solution would be good for patients, doctors, and companies. Therapy. It's simpler and it's more effective. It takes compliance and cost off the table. Eyes are more comfortable. This is a patient who has had surgery in the right eye but is still on medical therapy in the left eye. But it's not going to be either or. A, a, uh, a, a probable combination uh, for most uh, patients will be surgery and a drop a day. Innovation has been the elephant in the room, the FDA, which really stifles innovation. It, it treats glaucoma, which is a blinding, incurable disease with no good surgical treatment, almost like refractive surgery. And this can add years and millions of dollars to the development of any device promote innovation now. Well, we have plenty of ideas. The key is exchange. We need, we need organizations devoted to glaucoma surgery. We need a voice for glaucoma surgeons so that half the idea will always find the other half. And we're so grateful for the commitment that industry has shown to glaucoma surgery, and we hope it continues and expands because we need a partnership. Thanks to Laura Johnson and Don Bell. And I didn't know that they were going to be uh, featured in Tom's uh, lecture, but they've been so helpful to me over the years. Exploring the adjacent possible with attempts to innovate in glaucoma surgery. I feel like I've been in the red zone uh, three times, but have not been able to score. But my ultimate goal is still to be part of a breakthrough device 
But with the uncertainness of FDA approval and how long that might take, I feel like I need another goal, a shorter term goal, a more achievable goal. So what I hope for for myself is that the person who develops the breakthrough device put his arm around me and he'll say, I learned from the mistakes of others and you've been a real blessing. <laughs> Thank you very much.